From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, Taxpayers' Revolt. Are constitutional limits desirable? Hardly a day goes by that there isn't something new to report on what some are calling the story of the year, the taxpayers' revolt. It began, of course, when the people of California approved Proposition 13, which cut back their property taxes. Since then, taxpayer groups in many other states have developed similar programs to roll back taxes and to limit spending by state and local governments. In Congress, one effect of Proposition 13 has been efforts to cut many of the money bills under consideration. Along with proposals in both the House and in the Senate for a constitutional amendment to limit federal taxation and federal spending. Some of those proposals would also limit taxing and spending by state and local governments. The overall effect of such an approach is still unclear. What kinds of public services, for example, should be cut under the mandate of this taxpayer's revolt? Who gets hurt most when spending is limited? How far will this tax revolt fever go? What effect will it have on the nation's economic performance, such things as inflation, gross national product, and the cost of living? Welcome to another Public Policy Forum, presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Our roundtable discussion will consider the topic, Taxpayers' Revolt, Are Constitutional Limits Desirable? Appearing on the panel are Lee Alexander, Mayor of Syracuse, New York, since 1970. Mayor Alexander is past president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He is chairman of the Community Development Committee of the National League of Cities. Mayor Alexander helped prepare President Carter's urban policy statement. Robert Bork, Chancellor Kent Professor of Law and Legal History at Yale University. He is an adjunct scholar of the American Enterprise Institute. Professor Bork served as Solicitor General of the United States from 1973 to 1977. He is currently Chairman of the Advisory Council of AEI's Legal Policy Studies. Richard Headley, Chairman of the organization called Taxpayers United for Tax Limitation. It's a Michigan group promoting a state constitutional amendment freezing state and local taxes and limiting state spending. Mr. Headley served on the advisory board of the Small Business Administration in 1970. Carl Holman, president of the National Urban Coalition. Mr. Holman has served as a member of the Council on Human Relations in Atlanta and on the board of directors of the National Committee for the Support of Public Schools. As head of the Urban Coalition, Mr. Holman spearheaded a proposal to reform the federal budgetary process. John Charles Daly will moderate the roundtable discussion. Mr. Daly is a former news correspondent and news commentator for CBS and ABC News. He served as vice president of the ABC network and once headed the Voice of America. Now, here is Mr. Daly. This public policy forum, part of a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute, is concerned with government spending and taxation and a broad pattern of campaigns throughout the nation to limit that spending. Our subject, taxpayers' revolt, are constitutional limits desirable? Well, this is the year of a new rising by the people of America against their government. And the shot heard around the world this time is Proposition 13, the jarvis gann Amendment to the California Constitution, by which some 65% of the voters of that state slashed property taxes by some 60%. The phrase makers are calling it the great tax revolt of 1978. Now clearly, what had seemed a series of isolated local actions, New Jersey and Tennessee had voted to limit annual increases in state spending. Voters in Ohio and the cities and towns of Ohio rejected well over half the school financing measures on the ballots. In Massachusetts, Michigan, Idaho, Utah, Oregon, in 19 states altogether, campaigns to cut specific taxes or limit annual increases or just limit government expenditures 
taken together with the overwhelming success of Proposition 13, sounded a clear warning of a nationwide tax revolt calling the citizenry to the barricades. In Washington, Kansas Senator Dole introduced in the Senate a proposed constitutional amendment to mandate a balanced federal budget each year. 23 state legislatures have called for a constitutional convention, need action by only 11 more states to achieve it. Taking another route, New York's Congressman Jack Kemp and Delaware's Senator William Roth dropped in the Congressional Harpers a bill to cut federal income taxes by 30% over three years, and that would be regardless of the impact on the budget. An Associated Press NBC poll at mid-year sampled public opinion on a constitutional amendment to cut federal, state, and local tax collections and to limit future taxes. And 67% favored an amendment, only 20% were opposed. In recent days, Walter Heller, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors from 1961 to 1964, issued a warning to the National Conference of State Legislatures. Don't put your heads in the sand, he said. Something is going to happen. Mr. Headley, you have led with substantial success a campaign in Michigan to put uh, limitations on state spending. And uh, what is your program, and uh, why is it a good program? Well, John, let me start off with why it's a good program. In the last 10 years, spending in the state of Michigan has gone up 235%, while the gross personal income in the state's gone up 140%. The number of state employees has gone up 50.3%, while the population has grown 6.7%. <laughs> Government's out of control, spending's out of control, and we feel that we must have a comprehensive approach to tax limitations. So we have proposed a constitutional amendment which will control all forms of taxation and spending in the state of Michigan, limiting state spending to its current share of the gross personal income in the economic pie. The second thing we've done is we've stabilized property taxes at their current level and indexed them to the consumer price index of the U.S. Department of Labor. The third thing we've done, which really grates the legislature, we insist that all state mandated costs be paid for by the legislators. And um, that's going to stop a lot of meddling uh, from the state to local government. Hopefully we can do the same thing federally someday. Fine. Mr. Holman, as president of the National Urban Coalition, focusing on the survival and the success of the American city, do you see the present actions as an angry warning to governments to clean house and shape up? Or do you see it as a long-term movement which bodes ill for public services in cities and particularly uh, threatens services to the disadvantaged? Well, it certainly is a uh, warning, and it's being seen as such by politicians who are scuttling for cover all over. Uh, and um, I think that it does have a real possibility of uh, some long-term ramifications, if only because uh, it demonstrates that uh, you can take what is an essentially a class interest um, uh, move of the kind that's involved in terms of what the homeowners were trying to do and rightly trying to do there. They're in a state which had enormous, enormously high taxes, an effective system of collecting uh, those taxes, and uh, they had very zealous and e effective leadership. I think it's going to, in other states, it may not be quite the tidal wave that people have thought we're going to get a lot of litigation and we're going to get some people who begin to find that you can't, for example, do some of the things in the cities we're talking about doing if in the course of this reform move you find yourself, uh, as we saw in, in California, a new class of police recruits who were sworn in and then told they had no jobs. They were made up largely of women, of blacks, and of Chicanos. And uh, so I, I expect to see this movement move across the country, but I'm not so sure that it's going to move with quite the ease that it moved in the state where you had a, 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 a surplus of $5 billion. All right, Mr. Bork, as a former Solicitor General of the United States, the uh, federal government's advocate before the United States Supreme Court, what of the constitutionality of limitations on spending and taxation? I believe five challenges against Proposition 13 in California have already been lodged in the California Supreme Court. There may be uh, reason to question the constitutionality of Proposition 13 in a variety of ways. There would be less reason to question the uh, 
constitutionality, say at the federal level, of a well-drafted constitutional amendment. I think from a uh, constitutional lawyer's point of view, the interesting aspect of this movement to limit taxes by constitutional amendment is that it necessarily rests on the idea, which is quite widespread now, that the processes of representative democracy do not work adequately and that they do not work adequately in the most basic areas of government, that is taxing and spending. And that's quite a statement about uh, our basic democratic idea in this country, that it isn't working adequately and it isn't adequately working in many areas besides taxing and spending. Uh, hence, the fundamental idea of a constitution is to cure those areas where democracy does not work well. That is why this movement at this time all right, Mayor Alexander, you are a past president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and as uh, one who is potentially in the middle of the current maelstrom, as the elected mayor of Syracuse, New York right now, do you agree with Walter Heller that something is going to happen, and if so, what? Yes, something will happen. I don't know what. I don't, I'm not sure anyone really does know or will know until the dust settles in California, because as my friend on my left, my extreme left, said that uh, very well, there were unique circumstances in California, some five or six billion dollars in surplus, an escalation in the property tax, uh, the property taxes soared over the uh, few years just before this, and the legislature had the outrageous nerve to continue collecting taxes with this enormous surplus. That's the perception of the public. But I must disagree uh, politely with Mr. Borg when he says this means that uh, they're dissatisfied with representative democracy because I think the public was limited to just local government. If they could file a Proposition 13 against the income tax, which they do not have the right to do, they probably would do that. This was their only avenue, the only one that they could address themselves to. But I think it means more. I think that Proposition 13 is a clarion call for tax reform. In about eight hours of voting in California, a new ice age descended on us, and we're seeing the dinosaurs go into the swamp. And I think those of us who do not heed that message will probably wind up in the swamp with them. But until this country stops expecting cities to act like nations, and that's what cities do, in all the industrial nations of this world, America ranks foremost at the top of the list of those nations who expect local government to, del to deliver health, education, and welfare services. In most of the industrial nations of this world, those functions are handled by the federal government. I think what the California taxpayers are saying to me, and this is backed up by a Harris poll that was taken recently, it's a call for tax reform. That the taxes in this country should be collected from those who have the ability to pay. And that means the income tax, not the property tax. That means taxes that expand when inflation uh, hits the economy not the property tax, which uh, afflicts everyone regardless of their ability to pay. First of all, uh, the fact that uh, the people who have the ability to pay should pay, uh, you know, 93% of the taxes now are paid by 50% of the people. The, the bottom 50% of the people only pay 7% of the taxes. So, so that, that theory is really not why people are upset. The pe people are upset with all forms of taxation not just the income tax, it's just uh, the deluge of the number of taxes that they lay off on people. They're not getting ahead. And now they've got the 7% inflation tax generated by 20 or 30 years of excesses at the federal level. Uh, incorrect monetary policy. So you've got all the income taxes, property taxes, gas taxes, booze taxes, cigarette taxes, local taxes, state taxes, federal taxes, and the 7% inflation tax. 42% of the money now goes to the government. That, that's, uh, we work until somewhere Which between, some, some, all forms of government. <clears throat> somewhere between, depending on who you're talking to, somewhere between May 9th and May 29th, we work for the government every year. People don't understand that, and they don't feel like things are getting any better. And I, I think uh, oh. we have to recognize that, that uh, it's not just a case of another reform, which the people recognize is another tax increase, shifting it, for example, to business. Well, you know, business doesn't pay any taxes, John. Business collects taxes for the government. People pay all the taxes. You raise the tax on Ford Motor Company, Henry doesn't pay a dime of it. It goes to the guy that buys the next Ford, the next Lincoln. So don't talk to me about tax reform. Talk to me about tax restraint and getting a handle on government. It's out of control, and the people want it under control. Jarvis Gann is not the way to get government under control. It's a way to dislocate services. It's a radical, irrational approach to a very serious problem. 
We need to control all forms of taxation. We don't need to shift it from property to income to something else. We, we need tax restraint and overall control of government. Does that get things to uh, okay? <coughs> that, That's beautiful, yes, Your Honor. That's, You're uh, next. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> in defense of uh, your position, uh, you are right when you say that people are annoyed with taxation. But what they did in California was to use a meat axe. No what question they should have it. used was a scalpel. As far as this country being so taxed so heavily, let me give you some statistics. Of all the industrial nations, the United States is one of the lowest in terms of taxes in relationship to the gross national product. The United States pays 28% of the gross national product, collects in taxes. Other countries such as Austria, 37%, Belgium, 37%, 44%, Denmark, France, 37%. All of these countries have much heavier taxes than does America. What we have wrong here is a tax structure that's inequitable. We have developed very sophisticated taxing formulas, for example, at the federal level in the community development area. We'll count poverty, we'll count population, we'll count growth of housing, we'll count the average uh, rate of increase of uh, property values in the past five years. We've developed sophisticated formulas, but not in the property tax. We have one simple measure. What's the market value? And we take a percentage of that without regard to the fact that the people living in that house may not be able to pay that kind of tax. And I think what the people in California did was to target right in on the property tax because it's the most regressive and it's the most equitable. Now look, we've had a property cap, a cap on property taxes in New York State since the 19th century. And I live with it. My cap is 2% of the average five-year val five valuation of property at its uh, full market value. I think a cap is in order. I think 1% is much too low. I think that uh, a sales tax is a good example. A person can consume only so much. So a person earning $100,000 a year pays no more tax possibly than a person earning 25% because he can only consume so much. So that's an unfair tax. The property tax is regressive and they've struck that down. Now the Harris poll shows that the public, uh, as far as the, whether you believe the poll or not, the poll says that it's a call for tax reform, and I think it's just that. Other states have put caps on expenditures rather than on rate of tax, as New York has done, or on levies. They're trying to control it from the expenditure side. But look in my city, which is just a city of 200,000. Fifteen percent of my budget goes for the police department. If I were to take a referendum, they'd say cut not one dime out of the police department. The other 15 percent goes for the fire department. Not one dime would be cut from the fire department. That's 30%. The other 10% goes to picking up the garbage and taking care of the roads. That's 40%. Then 20% goes to employee benefits. Now, you have 40%, 60% of my budget covered there. I turn over 90% of my property tax, which is about $35 million a year. I turn 90% of it over to the Board of Education. I keep a few million dollars for the operation of the city. So I don't think the property tax should be expected to deliver education, or health as it presently is, or welfare. I don't disagree with that. I'm All right. Saying, I don't, now, what if I'm you saying transfer is I, that burden from us, but we wouldn't have to tax as much. We but, could cut our taxes. What I'm saying is that reform doesn't come first. Overall limitation comes first. Only so much of the gross personal income of the people can go to taxations of all forms. Mr. Boyd? So I think what we're concerned about is the overall amount of the wealth of this society which is consumed by government often without any particular indication that it's consumed wisely or well or to our benefit. And that's why I think this movement has to move on to an idea about an amendment to the federal constitution, the United States Constitution, to limit the amount of federal spending that can take place, which would have effects upon inflation and so forth. I don't think it's a problem of tax reform. Uh, I, I take it from your remarks that you think there is something to taxing the rich, those able to pay. It turns out that if you tax the really rich, you could probably buy three martinis for every man, woman, and child in this country and would have dissipated all of that wealth. There isn't that much wealth there. Disagree. All right. Unless you, by the rich, you mean people making more than $25,000 a year. Uh, We're taxing the poor to pay for the rich when we impose a property tax well, on people. No, actually, now, Mr. Headley, as I understand your petition, which has successfully gained a place in the bed, you want to limit uh, you want to freeze all ta taxes at present levels? 
That's correct. And freeze taxes at 9.7% of the total personal income in the state of Michigan? Actually, it works out to about 9.2. Let me just show you a couple of charts here for the panel and, and uh, maybe the people out back can look at it later. Here, here's, here's what's been happening. Here's the economic pie. Here's the federal and local government share. That's you, Mayor, and that group, the Green. This is the state government share, and this is the individual share here, the economic pie. What we're saying, we want to freeze all state taxation and spending, spending to their current share of the economic pie. Give them a stake in economic growth. Put them on a commission, call it what you want. As the economy grows within the state, the state will have more dollars to work with. But they won't be able to encroach on the individual share of the economic pie without a vote of the people. If they want to improve their share of the economic pie, they can, but with a vote of the people. In a year when there's an emergency, the legislature with a two-thirds majority can exceed their share of the economic pie for that specific emergency no, for that specific year. Uh, the, one of the interesting things about all this is that when people talk about limitations, they are asking for limitations which bring to referendum and to, and to a vote of the people a larger number of people. For example, in California, it will take a larger percentage of the population to vote taxes again than Mr. even Mr. Jarvis and Gann were able to collect uh, for what they're doing. And I'm sure that Mr. Bork uh, is absolutely right when he says that uh, people are unhappy about government. It does bother me a little when we say we're so bothered about representative government and what representative government can do just about the time a few of us start getting into representative government that we are ready to start talking about constitutional amendments. Um, I don't mind constitutional amendments. Uh, all of us have our favorites. We're for ERA, we probably would be opposed to this one. But the whole notion of a constitutional convention scares me to death, and it scares me to death because all of the readings that have been taken so far suggest that if a constitutional convention were called tomorrow, the Bill of Rights would be one of the first things to go. I, I, I'm very much worried about people piggybacking on their, their natural concern about what's happening to them in taxes and then moving to a constitutional convention which opens itself up to some things which I think we haven't adequately uh, gauged. The clever thing to do would be to head the states off by having two-thirds of each house of the Congress present a constitutional amendment to the states. And that doesn't open anything up. All that does is put the amendment, be, a specified amendment, before the states. And there's no chance. But let me. I let think me also, historically, is it not true, Mr. Solicitor General, there never has been a successful amendment put before the uh, put into the Constitution by the Constitutional Convention procedure. I don't it's recall. Very it. lengthy, very difficult, very yeah, tricky. I, I hope uh, it continues that way, and I hope representative government continues for well, a little longer. Well, let me. Say, uh, no, no. I think representative government ought to continue, yeah. but it ought to do those things it does well. And I and let me yeah. say that I think there are structural defects. Yeah. If you look at the city level, for example, and ask what has happened to expenditures, and one of the problems is the enormous strength in some cities of government employee unions which control really essential services. They're very hard to bargain with because if they go out, police, fire, garbage collection, everything, uh, things you badly need are gone. Much more power in that sense than a private union. Now, on the other side, there's a mayor with very little incentive to fight them very hard. And in some cities, I'm sure not in Syracuse, but I can think of one in the, I can think of one in the same state rather larger than Syracuse. Uh, one of the things that was done was to say, the mayor to say, I won't be here 10 years from now. I'll either be in the White House or doing something else. And one thing I can do is pay these folks off with pension promises, which will come due at a time when I'm not here. And then in San Francisco, as I recall, we have $18,000 a year street sweepers. Well, you know, in some sense, at that point, representative government isn't working terribly well. In the national level and at the state level, you have the problem of intense interest groups coupled with bureaucracies, segments of the bureaucracies who have interest in these programs, who press for one program at a time. Each interest group has its interest. The rest of us are kind of generally unhappy about the growth of spending but we can't focus on any one particular program, and so we keep losing, and the overall adds up to a total that none of us want. And in that sense, there are structural defects in representative democracy that a constitutional amendment saying the pie for the government is that big, now representatives sit down and whack it up and make up your priorities. 
that is a cure for the structural defects in what's taking place now. Mr. Jarvis has given a thumbnail description of why he launched what he himself admits is an imper imperfect vehicle, 13. Uh, he says the only way to cut government spending is not to give them the money in the first place. Now that is a, a general structure that you're talking about when you, you restrict the amount. I, well, I think that's right. You see, there's been a lot of dialogue about sunset laws and zero-based budgeting, but nobody can show us an example where it's worked in the public sector. Why? Because you've never defined their share of the economic pie. Once you've defined it, then sunset laws and zero-based budgeting, which this president would, would like dearly to do, will, will then work. But they won't work when there's an unlimited supply of money. It just won't happen. Well, there is Mr. not Mayor. an unlimited supply of money at the local level of government. And unfortunately, the property tax uh, uh, meat axe approach that the Jarvis Amendment uh, represents to me and to many of us uh, here is the wrong way to go about it. I agree with we that, We need Mayor. police and fire protection. The federal government only pays about 8% of the cost of educating our young people in this country. That's outrageous. Uh, we in New York uh, pay 50% of the cost of welfare, 25% from the state, 25% from local units of government. But this business of caps is not new. In 1974, the ACIR made a study of uh, various states, and they found ACIR that... ACIR being? Uh, the uh, Committee on Intergovernmental Relations, Marketing, uh, studied uh, the situation and found that all but 12 states in the union have caps in one form or another, <coughs> restraints. Most of them, I would, I would say probably most of them, are on the rate or on the levy as opposed to the expenditure. Uh, I need so much to run my city. There's a set limit. Now, my city is the only city in New York State that's been running the black each and every year. But I've done it by being a fierce uh, advocate of federal and state sources of revenue. But when you cut state budgets, let me remind you that every dollar of uh, revenues received from outside the local unit of government, 80 cents of it comes from the state, and only 20 percent comes from the national, 20 cents comes from the national government. We collect four times as much from the state as we do from the federal government. I give 45 percent to the Board of Education. I'm Chief Fiscal Officer for the Board of Education. 45 percent of my total available funds, and as I said before in another way, 90 percent of all the property taxes I collect goes to the Board of Education. Now, there isn't one person that would say they want to reduce their demands. Let's back into it from the other way. Is Proposition 13 mean that the California residents are saying that they want less services? I don't think that's necessarily true. Not when there's a five or six or seven billion dollar surplus overhanging the issue. Not when they're uh, angered by the soaring property tax increases. Property taxes increased from 1973 to 1976 in California from six billion to $12 billion, an outrageous astronomical amount of money, you know, when they have that kind of a surplus. Now, I, I'm not beating up the California legislators. The public did that in California, not me. But it isn't fair to, to take that information and translate it into what anyone wants it to mean and say well, it, it means very simply people want restraint on spending. Let me ask the question this way. Are they prepared to restrain their demands for police and fire protection? Can I just answer? Or education? Since I, can I answer this question for just a minute, Bob? Do I get my chance sooner? Yes. Yeah, okay, you'll come right. next right after. You haven't asked yeah. me. Well, well first, first of all, let me understand. Our proposal is to stabilize property taxes are where they are today and allow them to grow as the consumer price index of the U.S. Department of Labor grows which means you can pay salary increases to school teachers, firemen, policemen. We don't believe that local services where really people want to pay the price. We don't think that's where their real gripe is, even though the lightning rod may be property taxes because it comes in one bite twice a year or twice a year in bites, you see. So understand our proposal has nothing to do with this Jarvis Gann approach. It stabilizes property taxes where they are now, allows them to grow with the consumer price index. Secondly, we are not cutting state spending. We're saying, here's your share of the economic pie. Now, you define within that economic pie what your priorities are, and through zero-based budgeting, sunset laws, fund new programs, expand current programs. Now, we're $800 billion in debt, fast on our way to a trillion dollars in debt. The, the deficit interest each year is $50 billion. That was all generated, and now it's kicking back to us a 7% tax. That was all generated by a generation of people, including me and the people who this preceded me, who wouldn't live within their income and wanted to put their groceries, 
their year-to-year -year expenditures on Bank AmeriCard. Fly now, pay later. We've been electing people to public office who have been spending outside of our income year after year after year till now our children are saddled with almost a trillion dollars in debt. Interest rates are 10 percent, inflation 7 percent, and, and we sit back like, like business as usual and want to continue going on this way. I frankly think we've got some deep moral questions in controlling the size of government and what we've allowed to go on over the past 30 years when people have said to us that we could spend, spend, spend that wouldn't hurt anybody. Mr. Solicitor General. Well, let me uh, try to uh, stop talking about Jarvis and, and ask you about the concept. I think what's at stake is the question of incentives in this society and the question of the vitality and the strength of our economy. <laughs> and therefore, let me ask you, what you would think about caps on expenditures or spending at the federal, state, and local levels, at all levels. Uh, caps which would say free spending at its current level with adjustment upward for population growth, adjustment upward for inflation, but no adjustment upward for real economic growth, which would mean uh, that the gov as, as real economic growth occurred, we would still have the same level of government service per person but the government share of the total economic pie would shrink as real economic growth occurred. What about that concept? Are you for or against that concept? I have pretty good notion of how all the caps are likely to work uh, because we are in a society in which uh, things are going to happen in the small as they're happening in the large uh, in, in California. It'll just be different. If you say to legislators that you have only so much money to spend, I know pretty much where they will spend it. Uh, the president said, do not spend money for this, these, uh, these naval vessels that we really do not need. And the same people who argue for caps and all that make it pretty clear it's all right for this money to go for defense. So many people who will agree to the caps will find themselves facing a situation in which as the decisions are made, the decisions will be made in such a way that the, in any state capital that I know of, cities are not going to do very, very well under the kinds of, of, uh, of change that you're talking about. And the change is coming. There are going to be restrictions. I do not believe in, in for example, I don't believe in this, these, um, these pensions that have been voted which, for which there is no money. Uh, now and, and uh, probably won't be any later. But I would have wanted to ask you this, Mr. Headley. We're trying in many cities to try to bring business back into the cities. In order to do that, many cities have been providing certain kinds of tax incentives. Uh, how would that operate in the city of Detroit under, the, under your um, proposed uh, amendment or law? We have a statutory provision that's provision 198 in Michigan which allows for tax abatement and uh, frankly it's to encourage business to, to uh, refurbish, to build new plants, to generate jobs. Would that have to be voted on? No sir, no. no that, that, that is not a new tax, it's the application of an old tax. All right, now I would ask your honor if you would respond to uh, Mr. Bork's question with respect to caps. I think there's a lot of merit to uh, caps. I have no objection. I live with one. As I said, I have a 2% cap. My operating expenses are limited to 2% of my full market value. At the federal level, we've done the same thing through tax cuts. Federal revenues grow naturally during periods of inflation. But I was just looking at this chart. It shows that state and local tax receipts compared to federal receipts, at the local level, 81% of the receipts come from the property tax, or so some $50 billion. At the national level, less than uh, 3%. So you see, property tax hits local government. What I'm saying is that it's unfortunate. Uh, sure, the public is angry, and I sympathize with them at the taxes, at the heavy taxes that they're paying. But it's unfortunate that it took it out on local government in California. We're on your side. We're no, I'm not, yeah. I'm, I just want to emphasize <laughs> that point. Yeah. I yeah. think that if there's to be a restraint, that the restraint should not be on local government, which is sorely pressed, to meet the demands that are made upon. Look, it'd be very fine if you and I could walk in a, into a hotel, order a nice dinner, and you and I would sign a petition that this dinner should only cost $2. But the hotel could not deliver it. Now, it's very nice to demand the services that you do from your local levels of government and say, practice restraint. I want you to tighten your belt and bite down on the bullet. We all do that. We all admire those things. But still, the public demands certain services. Let me ask the mayor, may we sign you up now as part of a movement? 
to place a limitation upon federal, state, and local spending where it now stands with adjustment upward only for population growth and inflation? I, I can't uh, answer yes or no to that until I know fully what you intend to accomplish well, I, by I, that. I, I intend to stop any increase in spending. Well, I would say some increases are necessary at the federal level with a comparison deduction at reduction at the local level. Okay, for example, okay, as long as total. For example, same. I would like to see the welfare load picked up at the le federal level. Now, that's why I disagree respectfully with the president who said he wants to limit spending to 21 percent of the gross national product. But at the same time, the president is in the forefront in the fight for uh, federal takeover of welfare, for national health, and the president has said that he believes these are very important uh, goals. But he can't achieve those goals if he insists that federal spending should be limited to 21 percent GNP. Because when a federal government eventually takes the cost of those programs over, not all at once, but on a phased in basis, the cost will be billions of dollars. That will increase federal spending. Let's go to a different aspect of that, though. So far, in terms of, of action, the tax revolt is strongest at the state and the local level. Now, do you gentlemen see, or in your case, Your Honor, do you hope that uh, spending responsibilities will simply be pushed up to the federal level, particularly in areas of services to the disadvantaged, to the ill, and so forth, and that the decision-making process then becomes even more centralized, which I would think you would find defeating in one of your principal philosophies. Well, what? that is a contradiction. We say that those officials who are elected at the local level are the most efficient because they are closest to the people that they serve. And the city halls of this nation have really, in fact, become early warning stations for America. We hear those sentiments uh, much more quickly than do our representatives at the state or national level because people walk into city hall. They see me on the street, and believe me, sometimes <laughs> I wish I could listen to every one of them, but their complaint is loud and clear. But there's very relief, uh, little relief that a mayor can give. Mr. Holm? We do have, in effect, a cap which is operating now at the federal level. We have, a, we have two budget committees, and those two budget committees have been successful when they tried to limit one kind of spending and not successful when they tried to limit the other. If they had a, a pie of a certain size, we can tell you what they would spend that money for and where they, where they would not spend it. Would, they would not spend it in and for the cities. And if uh, any mayor believes that, he has only to look at what has happened to urban legislation, what has happened to legislation that related to the poor, and the number of people pushing these caps all around the country who say one of the things we're going to do is get rid of welfare. And what we're going to do in many cases, and what's going to happen in many cases, is that we're going to move people from one side of the ledger to the other because hidden behind everything else that I think everyone over here is saying is the notion that there is this, this fettered, shackled, chained, private enterprise system that is just waiting to bound into action and take care of all of our problems. I talked with three major businessmen in California, and they said to me that they had no notion at all that any of the kinds of growth that were being suggested by some of the proponents was likely to occur. Some businessmen have said to me, if you want to deal with welfare problems, that's something for the government. They can, everybody knows that we can hire in the private sector people who have certain kinds of backgrounds and certain kinds of abilities. Structural unemployment you will have and you'll have in larger measure once you start capping all of these governments. Let me, we have, we have little time left in this area and I think, you know, we are concerned with whether constitutional limitation is desirable. So Mr. Bork, Mr. Heller, who as I noted earlier said it, it's now inevitable that something is going to happen, thinks uh, that statutory limits on spending rather than a constitutional limit would be uh, pre preferable and more efficient. Would you comment on that? Well, if the problem is that uh, there are structural defects by the, in, uh, in the resistance to total spending being much weaker than the individual interest groups getting each of their own programs in, then a statutory limit will be breached. And indeed, this new budget procedure that the Congress has set up has been breached more often than it's been honored. So that if we're serious about it, I am not one who likes to amend the Constitution. And I have resisted it in a number of areas where I agreed with the objective, but I don't think we should play with the Constitution. But it does seem to me that the tax burden 
upon the American people is, and upon American, American economy has become so serious and shows no sign of abating that maybe the time has come to consider a constitutional amendment to say, okay, present levels of spending, but no more. Well, I think we've put down a very broad base, gentlemen, and it's time to open the question and answer session. All right, may I have the first question, please? Sir? Yes, Mr. Moderator, uh, the name is Eugene Austin. I'm Deputy Chief Counsel of the Committee on the Budget, U.S. House of Representatives. I have a question direct to uh, Dr. Bork. I believe you indicated that the, uh, the Congressional Budget Resolution is, uh, has been violated or breached uh, more often than honored. Uh, is that an accurate uh, restatement of your, your statement? Uh, I, I read an article recently, I think, that said that the Congress had uh, rejected the recommendation of its Budget Committee 11 times out of 13 or something of that sort. Well, in, in terms of adopting the uh, budget resolution or breaching it uh, by uh, Going enacting laws that would exceed the, uh, the ceiling? Exceeding it. I, I understand that since the budget committee was formed, the budget has increased 15 percent, which was thought not to be the, obje the object. Well, I should indicate very quickly that there is a two-step uh, process. A first budget resolution which sets targets. The second budget resolution sets the ceiling. The ceiling has not been broken uh, to date uh, with, with respect to the three Budget resolution that we have had since uh, the new congressional budget process uh, began. Just wanted to correct that. Okay, next question, please. Yes, sir. Yes, that yes, question, Mr. Bork. Yes. My name is Ken Barnes. Um, I think that your point that uh, if you don't limit the size of government, you will have a bunch of vested interests who will push their various uh, programs through without any consideration of, uh, of the total cost of, of the entire budget. However, I think when you recommend as a remedy putting a cap on government, you just haven't dealt with the question of who is going to get their share of the pie. The most powerful groups, as Mr. Holman said, will still get their share of the pie, and the poor, the weak, the disadvantaged will not. No. How do you deal with that, uh, with that point? Second, and the second point raised by Mr. Alexander is that the services which are provided by the public sector, by governments, are the kind of services which are not traditionally provided by free enterprise, the private sector, because they're not profitable. No. How do you deal with providing desirable services which are unprofitable when you limit the size of government? <coughs> well, I, you know, we're talking about limiting the size of government, size of government expenditure to what it is now. And it should be said that right now, one third of the people in this nation are dependent upon government for their, for their uh, income, which means that two thirds of us are supporting one third. That one third consists of government employees, people on welfare, people on social security, and so forth. That seems to me an adequate proportion of the population uh, taken care of. Uh, you can call them weak and powerless. However, they seem to do much better in the budget than does the Defense Department, for example. Uh, as far as services, uh, and, and if we set a limit to the total uh, government expenditure, it is true that priorities will have to be set and we'll have to decide what priorities each of those kinds of expenditures uh, have. Uh, I suppose that's the ordinary process of democracy. In, t in terms of services provided by the government, if we uh, freeze government spending where it is now with adjustment for inflation and so forth, uh, those services aren't going to go away. We're not talking about Jarvis. We're not talking about cutting 60 percent from the expenditure. We're talking about freezing it where it is now uh, with adjustment for inflation and for population growth. Services will be there. They're not going to disappear. Well, you, uh, you um, perhaps I can come at it a different way. You eliminate with that simple statement the goals that the majority of our representatives in Congress and in our Senate have said are laudable goals for this country. And that's the assumption of uh, health and welfare by the federal government. And the cost of that cannot be contained within your prescription or proscription. Uh, I'm concerned when we talk about freezes because it seems to me if I walked into your company, uh, Richard, and I said to you, now I want you to run your company within this many dollars and uh, don't tell me about how much it costs to run because I don't want to know about the cost. This is the limit. I think you'd say to me, that's absurd. Sit down with me and let me show you how much it costs to run the company. That's exactly how it is. All right. That's now, exactly when how you, it is. I have to run you, it within but, a budget. But when people say there should be a freeze or there should be arbitrary limits, and then in the same breath, speak about zero budgeting, I think there's a contradiction there. Zero budgeting says you take the cost of the operation from zero and you start computing the cost until you arrive at the bottom line. You don't take on last year's figures and just tack on more figures. So what I would like you to do is come to my city 
or any city in this country and say, how much are you spending for this service, rather than say to me, now here's your limit. Uh, you spend it any way you want, but don't go over it. And then, in that way, we can reach a reasonable conclusion and an equitable uh, judgment, not an arbitrary, capricious one, but one based on an examination of what the public is demanding. As I said, I have faith that the American public will pay for what they want. And I think that well, there's, there's some nothing, distortion. History doesn't bear that out. But there's, yes, uh, what they're saying is billion they, dollars in debt. They are saying is that we will not pay for certain services by putting it on our property taxes. That's what they're saying, I think. Well, I'd just like to uh, right, right. a couple of comments. First of all, uh, one of your f friends here in town uh, made the statement a few weeks ago that there's a $7 billion uh, uh, slop rate in HEW. Now, $7 billion is peanuts to most of the folks here. But $7 billion, that, that's, that's a ton of money. That, that's the whole budget for a whole year for the, all the services we're talking about for the whole state of Michigan. Now, if you, there's plenty of places to, that we can pare back if we manage it properly. It's just that when you have an unlimited supply of money, you don't manage things very well. And to, to assume that just because we're going to restrain government, that the, the people who need help aren't going to get help, I think is a faulty assumption. To say that we're going to spend it on B-1 bombers rather than helping people who need help, I think is a faulty assumption. I frankly think the American people are better than that, sounder than that, and, and they're finer people than that. But there are people in our society that ought to be helped in a different way. Uh, they ought to be helped through different types. But we ought to, instead of saying we need more money, we ought to question the leadership, the creativity, the approach, the intent, and the results. And, and I frankly think that more money is not the answer, although that's always the public sector's answer. They're never questioned. And frankly, I do run my company yeah. just on that basis. If we don't sell some more product and generate more profit, I don't have more money to work on. I don't have an unlimited supply of money. Well, you know, some Senator people Dirksen have to get laid off then, right? Pardon? Some, some people have to get laid off. Then, That's right? precisely right. And then what happens to them? They get paid unemployment. Oh, yes. <laughs> so our, uh, precisely. And, and, where does the, uh, and what, where does that money come from? And what, what I'm saying is when they're on unemployment, I'd like to have them doing something productive. There's absolutely no reason they can't do something productive while they're on unemployment. Let me comment on something earlier. Senator Durkin. By the way, I, 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 I will say this. I run the company so well, we haven't laid anybody say off. one thing. I, I had always thought before that uh, uh, certain people felt that Franklin Roosevelt was the villain because he was the original creator of uh, big government. And I'm very glad to see that. Uh, no, but he, you just made this statement. You made this statement, Carl, that only in the last 10 or 20 years have we helped people. Only in the last 10 or 20 years have we helped people in an improper way. Franklin Roosevelt knew how to help people. And that was to keep them productive, keep them involved in society. Don't make them feel like they're on the dole. Yeah. Make them feel like they're constructive members of society. Yeah. We have lost that. Which in is fact, why he was accused of, of leaf raking uh, kind not of me. enterprises. Not by me. Well, yeah. it's not necessary to agree with all this to go no, along with your you movement. Speak about no. Okay. <laughs> hey, let me, let me ask one other point. There's, there's an economist at UCLA that did a recent study, once again, on all the programs we've done to lift people out of poverty. I think he estimated there were 240 some odd billion dollars going each year to help these people, food stamps, a ton of programs. He also did a profile, an economic model at the UCLA, and in that they pointed out that with something like 89 billion dollars in cash to all the people below the poverty level, they could bring them above the poverty level. So we're doing something wrong. You, you'd like to see that. I'd like to see that get voted. Do you have any idea how impossible that would be? Yeah, but there wasn't to all yeah. of it. Yeah, we see them, for example, I'd just like to just talk, you, you talk about the $7 billion from HEW. Uh, Joe, let's, Joe see if we can, let's see if we can agree on some things here. First of all, I don't think anybody believes that it is healthful to have a situation in which, uh, that you have a healthy situation if you have a situation in which people are being wasteful of anybody's money, including the Great. money that they get publicly. I saw that $7 billion figure, and I'd like to see whether or not what your medicine suggests would cure it. All the headlines that went around the country was that $7 billion in fraud, and of course everybody had that middle picture of some, some uh, uh, welfare mother who had uh, 19,000 different uh, checks that she was receiving and all that. Turns out only $1 billion of it had anything at all to do with fraud, and that's a large amount of money. The other six billion 
would not be taken care of unless you address some problems quite different from setting the cap. So I think that as we talk about these solutions, right. we've got to look what the solution will, will get us, but we ought not, uh, I think that we've had enough about liberals overpromising. I don't think conservatives ought to overpromise either. One of the things that, that these alternatives seem to be pointing toward is that more and more of these decisions are going to be made not at the local level, but they're going to be made at the state level and finally at the federal level because right now what is happening in the only place we have seen it is that the state made the decisions as to what was going to happen in those localities and they're furthest of all away from your taxpayers. I would think, Mr. Holman, that's precisely the reason to be better if the constitutional control started at the largest level, the federal level, and moved downward so that you didn't just federalize all of these problems. May I, I leave this one where it is at the moment? Yeah. Because we would like to get as many questions as we can. All right, the next question, please. My name is Elgin Grosskos, a financial consultant in Washington. I'll try to keep my question within 45 seconds, and I'll address it to any member of the panel who can answer it in 45 seconds. <laughs> it deals first with a German legend of a salt merchant who came in possession of a magic mill which would grow, turn out salt. He set it to work while at sea. The salt began to fill the vessel. And the vessel sank. The mill sets at the bottom of the sea, and that is why the sea is salt. Today, we are awash in a sea of inflation by a marble mill down on Constitution Avenue, which Mr. Roosevelt set up in 1932. He did so by getting Congress to pass a law authorizing the Treasury to sell to the Federal Reserve its debt obligations, its bonds, and receive, therefore, paper, irredeemable paper money, which passes as money, uh, legal tender. Today, there's about $100 billion of that worthless paper circulating in this country. Now, my question is, who needs uh, restriction on taxes when you have a magic mill to grind out paper money to the heart's content? Now, I ask any member of the panel, how can we stop that paper mill from grinding out this enormous, enormous uh, quantities of paper money which is flooding our country with inflation? Mr. Buck, you've been uh, our starting wheel. You, you? Uh, <coughs> you simply write the amendment in terms of a limit on spending, not upon taxes. And when there's a limit upon spending, there's much less incentive for the federal government to inflate because they can't spend it. Okay, next question, please. Yes, sir. Mike Balzano, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I'd like to address my question to the mayor. Mr. Mayor, most of us who have been around Washington for some time have, have been able to document uh, and, and see visible amounts of, of fiscal waste in the federal government. Uh, we hear about it and see it in state level. Uh, where, as a mayor, would you put the fix on it? I mean, you, you seem to be against putting a cap on it. You're against freezing the, 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 the top of it. Where would you suggest that this, this taxpayer go for relief? Well, of course, everyone uh, is very management-oriented, and I'm the first to point out, as I did earlier, that my city is probably the only major city in the state of New York that runs in the black, and I'm very proud of that fact. But there's a limit as to efficiency in government at the local level. The fact still remains, as I earlier indicated, that the large share of my operating budget goes to police, fire, and Department of Public Works and employee uh, payments. There's very little I can do about that unless to reduce those departments. But there's the notion that all we have to do is take this rusty machinery that sits in our cities and gold plate that machinery and it'll function a lot better. That's nonsense. There are structural uh, tax deformities that we have to correct. Now, if there's any level of government that's efficient, I happen to believe it's at the local level because the people put the pressure on us there. We're always under the microscope. We're always under siege, and that is as it should be. That makes us, I think, we're the most responsive uh, group of elected officials in the country because of our accessibility. Now, I'm not about to advise you uh, where the government at the federal level could be more efficient. All I know is that the government has developed some sophisticated tools in delivering aid to the cities, which should save billions of dollars in the long run. And we call it a targeting mechanism. In the past, when money was distributed, it distributed to those who needed it and those who did not. As a result of intensive lobbying by the mayors in this country and a cooperative administration under President Carter, 
we've developed some sophisticated formulas which will save the federal taxpayers billions of dollars because we will target in that money to where it's needed with various triggers. And I'm sure you're familiar with what I'm talking about. I think the government is moving in the right direction in that sense because it will take less dollars if we can find out where those dollars are best spent, best needed. Right, sir, will you ask the question? Yeah. My name is Bob Levine. Uh, this is Mr. Bork. Uh, you said that uh, what your proposal would do would limit government to its current share, which is one-third. But your precise proposal was to take account of inflation, increase government spending for that, take account of population change, increase government spending for that, explicitly not increase government spending for economic growth. In that case, logically, you're condemning government to an ever-decreasing share. That may be good or may be bad, but it shouldn't be represented as a constant share. No, no, I didn't say a constant share. I said a constant amount. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm not at all taken aback at the thought that government's share of the total economic pie might decline. I can, I can bear up under that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Forever and ever under a constitutional amendment? Uh, begins to sound attractive, yes. <laughs> all right, we only have time for one or two questions, ma'am. My name is Johnny Searles. I'm a social worker in the local school system. And we've been talking a lot about um, different people don't want income tax coming from different, don't want taxes coming from different places. And I'd like to ask each of you of what you think an equitable tax system would be, who should pay, and about how much. Mr. Headley? You know, I'm not here to say I think taxes are great, but frankly, uh, uh, we've worked hard for a couple hundred years. We've got taxes coming from a lot of different sources, and I think we've probably got equity. It got out of balance in California because of, of an aberration in, in the supply and demand of houses and property, what have you. All in all, people are concerned about the total bite, I mean, wherever it comes from. And so that's, that's what really what we have to be concerned about, the total bite. Let the legislative process continue to, to seek equity and fine tune it and carburetor or adjust it, but let's control, the, let's define the public sector. Let's define what of our economic pie we're going to devote to the public sector and then work within that definition. That answer was so comprehensive, I must take advantage of it to announce that we have run out of time. And this concludes another public policy forum presented by the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. On behalf of AEI, our heartfelt thanks to the distinguished and expert panelists, Mr. Richard Headley, Professor Robert Bork, Mayor Lee Alexander, and Mr. Carl Holman, and our thanks, too, to our guests and experts in the audience for their participation. This public policy forum on the taxpayers' revolt has brought you the views of four experts in the field. It was presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many viewpoints in the hope that by so doing, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036.